taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Peter Sutcliffe The Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe was born on June 2, 1946, in Bingley, UK. He grew up in a Catholic working-class family and was noted as somewhat of a loner at school. During his career he had various menial jobs with little success, either leaving or being sacked for a variety of reasons, including theft. Throughout the 60s these menial jobs twice included the role of gravedigger, which friends say gave him a macabre and often dark, sense of humor. One factor that stands out a little above the petty theft, is Sutcliffe's preponderance towards voyeurism in his teenage years. His main target was to watch prostitutes and their customers, reveling in the interaction between them. This appears to show an early inclination towards targeting sex workers that resulted in a thrill. During his years as a young man, it has been speculated that Peter Sutcliffe was a user of prostitutes, and that at some time he'd had a bad experience, possibly being relieved of his money, rather than his essence. As believable as this theory is, it is just that for the meantime, theory. No evidence thus far has been provided. Sutcliffe first met his wife Sonia Zerma, on the 14th of February, 1967. They were to be married on August 10, 1974, and were informed after several miscarriages that Sonia would never be able to bear children. After this setback Sonia returned to teacher training and also had an affair, before settling and buying a house with Sutcliffe, with whom she lived, up until his arrest. In 1969, Peter Sutcliffe would commit his first assault. After getting into an altercation with some prostitutes, Sutcliffe asked his friend Trevor Birds all to wait in his van while he went to solve the matter. He then followed the street worker into a garage and assaulted her, in his own words he said. I got out of the car, went across the road and hit her. The force of the impact tore the toe off the sock and whatever was in it came out. I went back to the car and got in it. After he returned to the vehicle, Sutcliffe sounded like he had been running and asked birds all to drive off quickly. The next day, Peter Sutcliffe was to get a visit from the police. The prostitute had taken down the car registration and reported the assault. Sutcliffe explained that he had only used his hand during the assault, but it was of no matter anyway. The lady in question had decided not to press further with any charges. Peter Sutcliffe didn't even receive a caution for his actions. The police officer who spoke to him said he was very lucky. It was a good few years then until Sutcliffe's next assault, which took place on 5 July, 1975. In the town of Keithley, Sutcliffe found Anna Rogelskitch walking alone and started his first attack as the Yorkshire Ripper. First he struck the young lady unconscious with a ball-peen hammer and then he set about slashing her midriff with a knife. This frenzied assault did not prove fatal thankfully as a neighbor heard the fracas and was able to disturb Sutcliffe enough that he fled. Although Rogelskinch survived the attack by the Yorkshire Ripper through the miracle of medical science, she would forever be traumatized by the random unprovoked assault. In August of 1975 he was to strike again, this time in Halifax. Using the same modus operandi as before. Sutcliffe approached Olivia Smell from behind and struck her with his hammer, hoping to render the young woman unconscious. Next he took out his knife and tried to slash at his victim's torso around the lower back, but again was disturbed in his grievous act. Olivia Smelt was badly beaten but survived her ordeal, she was also another victim who was left mentally scarred by Sutcliffe's actions. Still in August and on the 27th of the month, Peter Sutcliffe carried out another unprovoked assault. In a town called Silston, he struck 14-year-old Tracy Brown on the back of the head five times with his hammer as she walked down a country lane. This time he was disturbed by a passing car before any slashing could go on, Sutcliffe then fled the area. Tracy Brown would require brain surgery as a result of the attack. 
On 30 October, 1975, Peter Sutcliffe carried out his first murder. Wilma McCann was a mother of four, who was walking in Leeds when she was propositioned by Sutcliffe and they drove to a private area. Once there she was struck on the head with a hammer and once she was prone, Sutcliffe stabbed her 15 times to the neck, abdomen, and chest. These injuries would prove to be fatal. Due to the severity of the attack, a large inquiry took place that incorporated 150 officers and over 11,000 interviews. Sadly, the police failed to find the culprit. It wouldn't be long until the next murder now as he had a taste for it, and in January of 1976, Sutcliffe continued his cycle of attacks. 51-year-old Emily Jackson was a woman who was struggling to make her way and because of her dire financial position, she had resorted to practicing sexual favors in the family van for financial recompense. Unluckily for her, Peter Sutcliffe would be one of her punters. Emily was struck on the head with a hammer before being stabbed with a sharpened screwdriver in the neck and torso until she was dead. Sutcliffe left behind evidence at this scene however, after stamping on Ems Jackson's thigh he had left a boot print behind. The 9th of May, 1976, was to be the day of the Yorkshire Ripper's next assault. Marcella Claxton was walking home from a party in Leeds when Sutcliffe offered her a lift. After accepting his offer, she asked Sutcliffe if he would pull over in Roundy Park so that she could relieve herself. When she exited the vehicle and removed her trousers, she was struck from behind with a hammer several times before the attacker inexplicably left her to walk away, albeit with serious injuries that would require cranial surgery. For a short while the attacks on the woman of Yorkshire ceased, that was until 5 February, 1977. Irene Richardson was a prostitute who frequented the Roundy Park area of Leeds and was unfortunate enough to meet Peter Sutcliffe there that night. Irene was bludgeoned to death within the vicinity of the park with a hammer, almost at the exact spot where Marcella Claxton had been assaulted. After this, her killer mutilated the body after death with a bladed weapon. At this scene tire impressions were left and although this would seem a promising lead in the case, it turned out not to be so clear-cut. As the tire tracks involved could be linked to 100,000 vehicles in the Yorkshire area alone. On 23 April, 1977, Peter Sutcliffe killed another woman. Patricia Atkinson, or Tina as she was known to her friends, had been the worse for wear after an evening's drinking in the local pubs of Bradford, which was when Sutcliffe saw her and picked her up in his car. Tina took Sutcliffe back to her flat for business and was dispatched with the Ripper's usual aplomb. When she had turned her back on him, he had bludgeoned her with a claw hammer until she lay there, gurgling. After this he had exposed her breasts, slashed her, and then stabbed her repeatedly on the torso. Police found a bloody boot print at this scene and connected it with the Leeds attacks. They now knew their killer had cast his net further afield and was targeting Bradford, as well as Leeds. A couple of months later and Sutcliffe was haunting the streets of Leeds once again. 16-year-old Jane MacDonald, was walking home through the Chapel Town area after missing the last bus, when she was spotted by Sutcliffe, walking the streets. After following her for a short while, Sutcliffe attacked her from behind with a hammer as she approached an adventure playground. Once she was incapacitated, the creepy Yorkshireman dragged her face down over towards the corner of the playground, where he mutilated the body. He would later say that her shoes made, a horrible scraping noise, as he dragged the lifeless girl face down. This attack caught the eye of the public however as the victim had absolutely no links to prostitution and she was also very young. The outcry also appears to have affected Sutcliffe also, who went on to say. The next one I did I still feel terrible about, it was the young girl Jane MacDonald. I read recently about her father dying of a broken heart and it brought it all back to me. I realized what sort of a monster I had become. 
Two weeks after Jean McDonald's attack, in July, Maureen Long was ambling past the waiting line for taxis after a night on the town, when a white Ford Corsair pulled up. The driver asked her if she wanted a lift, and when she replied with an affirmative, they went on their way. After pulling onto some waste ground, Sutcliffe struck the woman on the head with his hammer while she was urinating. He then proceeded to rip her dress up to her waist and carry out his signature, slashing and stabbing Maureen around the midriff. In a staggering amount of good fortune, Maureen Long managed to survive the attack, though she couldn't give an identification of her attacker due to amnesia. This was outweighed however by an eyewitness, who saw a white Ford Cortina Mark II driving away from the scene at the time of the incident. With this fresh lead, the case had new impetus and drive, only it was looking at the wrong information. The eyewitness had been mistaken. Peter Sutcliffe's car was a white Ford Corsair, not a Ford Cortina. On 1 October, 1977, the Yorkshire Ripper extended his territory into Manchester. Curb crawling on the streets, Sutcliffe came across Jean Jordan, a 20-year-old mother of two who was a regular in Manchester's red light district. After agreeing on a price, Jean directed them to a piece of wasteland near a cemetery that was frequently used by prostitutes and amorous couples. When they arrived there and left the car, Sutcliffe brought a hammer with him and attacked Jordan with it as soon as she had turned her back. In total he would strike her eleven times with the hammer, flattening her head and disfiguring her appearance beyond normal means of identification. Whilst he was carrying out his depraved actions, he saw headlights come on and quickly hid the body in bushes before he was seen. When another car pulled in as the other vehicle left, he realized he wasn't going to be able to proceed in privacy and left hastily. It was in this haste that he left a £5 note in the prostitute's possession, that he believed could be traced back to himself. Due to this reason he returned to the crime scene a week later after a social gathering at his home. When he got there the note was nowhere to be seen and feeling increasingly frustrated, he mutilated the body with a knife and some glass before trying to decapitate her. Sutcliffe would confess later that the decapitation attempt was an effort to cover his tracks and throw Manchester authorities off the scent. Without the head, they wouldn't know that the Yorkshire Ripper was on their turf. When Jordan's body was found, there was no sign of her purse until a couple of days later. When it was picked up, police did make an attempt to trace the note and Peter Sutcliffe was interviewed, but due to the time that had passed and Sutcliffe's seemingly solid alibi, they let him go a free man and officers stopped trying to trace the note in January of 1978. It would be December 14, 1977, when Sutcliffe next took a victim. Marilyn Moore was working the streets when she saw a car slowly idling down the road, obviously looking for business. When she turned and caught up with the car around the corner, Sutcliffe was already out and waving by towards a house. As Marilyn strode past, he asked if she was available. When she replied that she was, they entered Sutcliffe's vehicle and made off for a quiet area in which to conduct business. When they got there and left the vehicle, Sutcliffe struck, but he momentarily lost his balance and most caught her with a glancing blow, allowing the young woman to let out a piercing scream. Quickly he struck her again before noticing passers by only 40 yards or so away. Upon realizing the witnesses he left the scene rapidly and luckily Marilyn Moore was able to survive the ordeal. Not only this but she provided an excellent likeness to Sutcliffe on a photo fit, though officers at the time were unsure whether they could trust her judgment due to the injuries she had suffered. The next murder would not occur until January of 1978, when 21-year-old prostitute Yvonne Pearson was murdered. Young Yvonne had been plying her trade on the streets of Bradford when she had the unfortunate circumstance of coming across Peter Sutcliffe. After she had directed him to a place they could get to business, Sutcliffe waited until her back was turned and then struck her with a hammer. 
as he was dragging her about 20 yards away to an old settee, another car appeared and parked next to his. This panicked Sutcliffe, who shoved horsehair from the sofa down Yvonne's throat while he held her nose, all in a bid to stop her making any noise. This was successful and Yvonne Pearson was dead by the time the other vehicle drove away. After his torment, Sutcliffe kicked and beat the body repeatedly before hiding it under the sofa. Yvonne Pearson would not be found until March 26, 1978. There is some mystery surrounding the newspaper supposedly found under the body from a later date than the actual murder. If this is correct, it does raise some questions, as Peter Sutcliffe denies ever returning to the Pearson scene. On 31 January, 1978, Peter Sutcliffe would spread his reign of terror to the people of Huddersfield. Helen Ritka was an 18-year-old prostitute who worked the red light area with her twin sister Rita. Helen was approached by Sutcliffe while Rita was away and the pair ended up in a timber yard, where Sutcliffe claims he became sexually aroused and had to make an excuse. As soon as he got behind her he brought out his hammer, but only succeeded in grazing the terrified woman. With another blow he had her down and struggling, but still conscious. Realizing that he was committing his heinous acts in full view of some local taxi drivers, albeit they weren't paying attention, Sutcliffe then dragged Helen over to the other side of the yard where he covered her mouth and had sexual intercourse with her. She was the only victim in which this was the case. After the act was over, Helen Ritka amazingly staggered to her feet and attempted to stumble towards the Ripper's car. Peter Sutcliffe savagely attacked her once more with the hammer, sending the teenager to the floor. He then returned to his car, retrieved a knife, and stabbed Helen to death, hiding her body amongst the timber. Ritka's sister reported her missing and her body was found three days later. On May 16, Vera Millward was plying her trade in the red light district of Manchester when Sutcliffe pulled up in his car. The pair agreed terms and they drove off to the grounds of the Manchester Royal Infirmary to conduct their liaison. 42-year-old Vera was a sickly woman, who had undergone two major operations in the last two previous years, she also only had one lung. When Sutcliffe got Vera to turn her back on him, she too became a victim. The Yorkshire Ripper struck her three times on the head with a hammer, killing her. Then he dragged Vera over to a fence where he slashed and stabbed the body. This attack was so frenzied that Ms. Millward's intestines would spill from her wounds. Her body was found the next morning. After this murder the Ripper appeared to quieten down again for a while. Sutcliffe's mother died in November of 1978, and this is quite often pointed to as the reason. It wouldn't last however, and on the 4th of April, 1979, another life would be taken. 19-year-old Josephine Whitaker was a building society clerk, who was walking home from her grandparents that evening. She, like the next five victims, had no links to the sex trade and was just an average citizen. It is claimed that this was due to the red light districts now being too highly monitored for he rippers liking. Sutcliffe was cruising round a residential area of Halifax when he spotted Josephine walking alone across some parkland. He got out of the car, taking his trusty ball peen hammer and sharpened screwdriver with him, and quickly caught up to his quarry. As they walked, Sutcliffe remarked that she should be more careful when crossing the fields. I said you don't know who you can trust these days. It sounds a bit evil now. There was I walking along with my hammer and a big Phillips screwdriver in my pocket ready to do the inevitable. After pausing behind the young woman, pretending to squint at a clock tower, Sutcliffe seized his moment and struck her with the hammer. Josephine fell to the ground making loud moans as she was struck again. As all this was happening, Sutcliffe had realized his proximity to the street and dragged the body into a more secluded area. He then stabbed her repeatedly with the screwdriver, also thrusting it into her vagina. At this scene police would find what seemed like vital forensics. 
present in Whitaker's wounds was a type of milling oil, also accompanied by tiny fragments of metal. Most likely from when Sutcliffe had sharpened the screwdriver. The problem was that these materials were present in a letter from a hoaxer, Wearside Jack. This would have a drastic effect on the investigation, dragging many officers and countless funds to the northeast of the UK, while Peter Sutcliffe was free to carry out his reign of terror. The man behind the hoax, John Samuel Humble, was charged with the crime on 20 October, 2005. In sentencing he received eight years. A harsh price to pay some might say, but would further murders have been prevented if the police had focused solely on Yorkshire like they were originally? It's impossible to know. On the 2nd of September the Ripper struck again. This time Barbara Leach, 20, had just left friends and was walking home, when she walked past someone sat with their car door open. After Barbara had gone by, Sutcliffe stood up and struck her down from behind with a hammer. He then dragged the young defenseless woman into a backyard, where he partially undressed her and stabbed her repeatedly with the sharpened screwdriver he had kept in his possession. Police discovered the remains the next day after her friends reported her missing. At this time, police were still unaware that Wearside Jack was a hoax. Thus, they spent a great deal of resources trying to generate leads that were lacking in fruit. Nearly a year later on August 20, 1980, Peter Sutcliffe struck again. He was on his way to Chapel Town, Leeds, when he spotted Marguerite Walls walking home on her own. He pulled in behind her, left the car, and then overtook her on foot. When Marguerite went by where he was stood, Sutcliffe flashed out with a hammer and then looped some rope around her neck while dragging her into a walled garden. Here he strangled the life from Marguerite before removing her clothing. There was no stabbing or slashing at the scene. Sutcliffe would claim that this was to throw officers off his track. If this was the case then it was successful, as the authorities at the time attributed it to someone else believing that the stabbing and slashing was an essential part to the Yorkshire Ripper's methodology. The next attack came on September 24, 1980. Dr. Apadya Ura was walking home after a party and decided to take a shortcut down one of Leeds' many alleyways. At this moment someone came up as if to walk past and then she was struck on the head with Sutcliffe's hammer. Quickly he looped the rope around her neck and started dragging the doctor, before deciding her shoes were making too much noise and discarding them over a wall. At this point Mrs. Valerie Nichols, who owned the property that backed onto the alleyway, came out to investigate. Sutcliffe fled the scene and the police were called. Dr. Rapadia Banda Ura survived her brutal ordeal. On November 5, bonfire night in the UK. Peter Sutcliffe returned to Huddersfield on his mission and was very nearly caught. After approaching 16-year-old Teresa Sykes from behind, Sutcliffe had struck her on the head with his hammer. Unfortunately for him, she screamed, loudly. Her neighbors and her fitness fanatic boyfriend heard the yells of anguish and rushed to the scene. The man who so bravely attacked lone women with a hammer from behind was now hiding under a bush as he waited for Teresa's boyfriend and neighbors to dissipate. Eventually they did and the Yorkshire Ripper breathed a sigh of relief. Peter Sutcliffe's final attack would come on Monday 17 November, 1980. 20-year-old student Jacqueline Hill was on her way home from a seminar, when she had caught the eye of Sutcliffe. Following her he stuck to his usual protocol approaching from behind and then striking with the hammer. When he had the young woman on the floor, another woman approached, so he quickly raised her up before dragging her onto some nearby vacant land. Once settled he removed her clothing and repeatedly stabbed Jacqueline with a screwdriver, including once in the eye. Jacqueline Hill would die from her injuries and her body was found the next day. During the course of the whole investigation, Peter Sutcliffe was interviewed a total of nine times without arrest. In 1981, on the 2nd of January, Peter Sutcliffe's luck was to run out. 
he was stopped in his car by officers in Sheffield, who found him to be in the company of prostitute, Olivia Ravers. When officers spoke to the pair, they were struck by Sutcliffe's similarity to the artist's impressions of the killer. Furthermore, they radioed in the registration and found out the car was on false number plates. With all these coincidences in one spot, the officers decided to take him in for questioning then and there. Peter Sutcliffe was then taken to Dewsbury Police Station in West Yorkshire for interrogation. The next day as officers weren't making much headway with their suspect, they decided to return to the scene of his arrest. During the initial contact, the original officers had allowed Sutcliffe a moment to pee. Upon returning they found a hammer, knife, and some rope at the scene. This now looked like he was their man. Even more so when they found another knife hidden in a police station toilet cistern, that Sutcliffe had access to. This was enough evidence for officers to get a search warrant for the Sutcliffe home at 6 Garden Lane, Peden, Bradford. They also brought Sutcliffe's wife Sonia in for questioning. Two days of intensive questioning was all it took for the Yorkshire Ripper to break. Telling the officers of his true identity and regaling them with his stories of murder, he would only ever show emotion over the murder of Jane MacDonald, and another murder that he denied and has since been proven innocent of. On 5 January, 1981, trial proceedings began in Peter Sutcliffe's case. The Yorkshire Ripper had decided to plead not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility claiming that God had made him carry out his despicable crimes, and that voices emanating from a Polish man's gravestone were God's voice, encouraging him to kill. The judge presiding over the case, Mr. Justice Borm, wasn't too amenable to Sutcliffe's defense and demanded a thorough explanation of paranoid schizophrenia. After the explanation he deemed Sutcliffe suitable for a trial by jury, and ordered the trial proper to begin on the 5th of May, 1981. The trial itself was a relatively normal affair and Peter Sutcliffe was found guilty of all charges brought before him. On the 22nd of May, he was to receive 20 life sentences to run concurrently. The judge also ordered a minimum 30-year term, which meant he would likely be kept in prison till at least 2011. Since his trial, Peter Sutcliffe has also admitted responsibility for two more attacks. The families of these victims have requested privacy and there have been no formal charges brought, as it would not be in the public interest. On 16 July, 2010, the High Court in Britain applied a whole life tariff to Peter Sutcliffe's sentence. It is now likely he will die in prison. During his time incarcerated, the Yorkshire Ripper has come under attack several times. In 1998 he lost the service of one eye, after he was stabbed in both by another convicted murderer.